everybody. Welcome back to the quest for the bestest. It's the podcast from Backlot Banter, where us four Backlot boys review every single best picture winner and try to figure out which one of them is the very best, or at least a plausibly deniable order of how they could all be ranked together. Today, we are talking about Cimarron from 1931. My name is Timo, joined, of course, by Tucker, Tanner, and Abram. And I... Maybe I could wait to talk about this film. Maybe I couldn't, can't wait. <laughs> I don't really know. I think we should just get into it as quickly as possible because this is like anyway. a, a befuddling movie. Abram, you got a comment, a singular one from our last episode talking about The Lost Weekend, which, oh, crap, totally <laughs> reminds Whoa. me. We got to do the housekeeping. We've got to know where this film went on our list. The Lost Weekend, that is, last, at last week's episode. Now, The Lost Weekend... We had to we had to do some some ties sorting out. It went at place number fifty three with an average score of seven point five. So pretty well for a film that came out a long time ago and that pretty much everybody besides from us has forgotten about. So congratulations, like to the Lost Weekend, for doing as yep. well as you did. Now, mm -hmm. will Cimarron do as well as it could do today? Yeah, only time will tell. Only time. Shouldn't every movie do as well as it could? Isn't that the point? Okay. See, see this. All of this is belongs. all of this is sort of demonstrating your brain on Cimarron, and I want to get into no. it. But before we do, okay. I want to read a comment. Yes. This comes from, again, the this newest is your brain of our on Cimarron. yes, <laughs> the newest of our uh, fostered boys, Max Fisher, who is back once again, writing the following on the last weekend episode. Being from Wisconsin, statistically the drunkest place on the planet, alcohol True. is so centric really? at the office. Oh yeah. yeah. Three yeah. the three drunk the three cities that consume the most alcohol per capita are all in Wisconsin. And all within like driving distance of each other. Yeah, that's Perfect. Red Letter Media's entire bit, if anybody yeah. out there is from the Red Letter Media. But uh, at the office I worked at, beer was in the lunchroom vending machine. There's a great movie in here if you can find your way past the hysteria soaked soundtrack. I especially like hmm. Jane Wigman's brightness and the director's wit that shines through in the less melodramatic moments. A friend of mine chills her wine by hanging it out the window. The missing gay subtext is an intriguing way to see the movie. An admirable expansion of Billy Wilder's usual range. And thanks for the nod. Max, you're welcome. You're welcome. Ma you know what? Here's another nod. Look at that. You just got four nods, Max. Uh-huh. That's a visual, that's that's, a visual that's joke. That's four for times the nod. It's a visual joke for all the podcast listeners. Yeah, they have no clue what's going on. Um... Do you have? Do any of us have any clue what happened in this movie? Does someone want to tackle, climb the mountain, scale, please. tame the wildness of this plot please. synopsis? Tanner? Please allow me. Be my guest, please. <laughs> Cast your minds back, if you will, to it was eighteen eighty nine, Oklahoma. We have a, a family of sorts, and it's and it's leading man. Oh, hang on. I'm, I gotta I gotta get the character names. Yancy yes. Cravat. Yancy. How could I forget? Sorry, Yancy Cravat or Kravit. I think it's Kravit. Yancy Kravit is a uh, settling man, addicted to settling, as one might yeah. say. And he sees the opportunity to stake out some brand spanking new land, except it belonged to other people, in the Oklahoma Territory. And he does. He stakes out some land in Oklahoma and uh, soon becomes a sort of a community leader for a boom town out there called Osage. And uh, through some some rigmaroles and some goings on, he becomes like the sort of mayor slash newspaper man slash preacher slash sheriff there. Uh, and but he can't handle all these hats. You know, he's only got he's only got room on his head for one 10 gallon cap. So he rides off into the sunset to go seek out greener pastures and uh, more adventures, leaving his wife whose name is Sabra, there with her with their two children. And he returns intermittently as as the town sort of grows and grows and into what we might recognize as modern-day Osage, into a modern-day city in 20th century America. Um, until eventually, we are in the year 1929, where we end our film, where Osage has grown into a bustling town. Uh, Sabra runs the newspaper there that they, that they founded all those years ago. And uh, come to find out that uh, Yancey has returned as sort of like a old hermit who works out at the the oil fields in Osage, and then he gets a fucking like torpedo to the chest or whatever, and he dies. The end. He gets an, he gets an oil to the chest, a really uh, yes. hard fast oil. He gets yeah. a torpedo. We, 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 we span what is that? Eighty nine, ninety nine. We go 
40 years. 40 years? It's 40, 40 years. years. Yeah. Because we ended It's very simple now. math, actually. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, we sp- we spanned forty years of the uh, the of the American West in the in the late nineteenth and twentieth centuries. The closing and, uh, of the American West, you might say. That's true. That's true. Um, right. And that's in in many ways, that's what this movie's about. Yancey, if if I if you I, I can do a little thematic talking right now, oh with maybe God. even Jesus, his character the intros, himself the, the, is a the, metaphor for the addiction of American settling. Wow, I, I might say. Okay, okay. Yeah. Don't say anything more. Sorry, Tanner. Sorry. What did you think about the movie? Since you so graciously gave us an excellent plot synopsis, it's all right. Like it's not good. I, I get. I, I'll end up giving it like a lower score, but maybe I'll maybe I'll raise it. But I'm not sensing that we're overwhelmingly positive about Cimarron because something that Abram said uh, about this film in, in our in our uh, group text uh, struck me. It's that this film will like do something interesting. For one, once in a while, and then go back to being boring for a while. And I think that I think that's pretty accurate. It has interesting ideas. the uh, The original novel, I think, is interesting in that when doing some reading for this, um, is that you know Yancey is gone for long stretches of this, of this film. He's our main character, and he's gone, and we're meant to feel his absence. That is purposeful in the novel, and it seems the same way here. But at the same time, like. You're just taking out an important cog of the film, I, I think. And ultimately, it's that, it's got, it doesn't have a lot of wheels left to run on when you take that one mm. out. But when he's there, I think it's kind of compelling, actually. But, you know, obviously he is gone for long stretches of the film. But what do you guys all think? Yeah, maybe sort of compelling is how I would describe it, too. I think that yeah. on face level, when you describe the plot of this film and the expansion of, of the United States West and watching a town grow from its very beginning, all of that I do find pretty compelling. And what is there, especially at the beginning, I think is well done and gets the seeds planted in the right way. But as the film gets going, it loses a lot of its own momentum, kind of mirroring how Yancey is kind of like losing interest in what's going on. And then mm-hmm. you're right, it takes a huge dip when he leaves because he's the most interesting part of the film. He is a pretty compelling character for his addiction to homesteading and uh and being surprisingly what i would say based in that he's like running a paper based on uh indigenous rights but then he's also talk about that yeah we'll talk about that but he's also Uh like continuing to take land from the native americans it's a whole thing but he that makes him a pretty interesting character that i want to learn more about um but the movie doesn't spend its last two half or third talking about him at all because he's gone um so it, it it sets up interesting things, but it is absolutely not falling through. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Abram, do you want to go? Yeah, I mean, I think the movie is boring. All I'm really interested in when it comes to Cimarron is trying to sort of interrogate its political position sure. and, mm-hmm. and what can do. and what Yancey represents as a sort of extension or reflection of like the American frontier myth or westward expansion or any of these ideas. That's all I'm really interested in, because otherwise, what does that even really say? We basically follow a series of vignettes as time passes in, like, in like the frontier. Mm-hmm. That's all that really happens. We, we, get a, we get a couple shootouts. We get a paper being developed. We get, like, some familial drama. We get, mm-hmm. like, a courtroom drama. Yeah. It's, all, it's like, strangely procedural. And it feels like a film that should take place. It, it feels like it should be like Gone with the Wind. It feels like I need to devote my entire afternoon to the movie. But you mm-hmm. don't. It's only two hours. And we co- mm-hmm. But we cover so much ground that it all becomes sort of just formulaic and uninteresting. Okay, and now here's this plot beat, and now here's this plot beat, and now here's this mm-hmm. plot beat. Yeah. And the only real constant, until he doesn't be, until he isn't one anymore, which is frankly even more interesting, uh, is sort of Yancey and how he progresses further and further into indigenous territory essentially mm-hmm. um and i, I th- the film sure you can read it as like what happens to these settlers who are dispossessed by like the industrializing of america and like the closing of the frontier but he still gets a, a statue built to him at the end of the movie that's true right so all memorialized Frank, forever in time for all he does right so mm. basically all i find interesting through the lens of discussion, not through the lens of an of an engaged audience member, is the uh-huh. situation of Yancey and the film's political position as well. Sure, mm-hmm. I 
I found myself thinking about that uh, as well as I watched Abram. Um, I kind of think that the film does bring up a lot of interesting ideas. This, the place of women in the frontier, Yancey's character seems very interesting to me. But you're right that it's like, it's kind of boring at the same time, and it doesn't go very far with these ideas. It's it's like, ooh, idea. Think about it. And then there's no answer or there's no yeah. further questions about the idea that the film presents. So it, it it reads kind of shallow, but while I'm watching it, I'm like, oh, this is like pretty, pretty interesting. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, I think Yancey Cravat has amazing drip. I think he is so freaking stylish in this movie. And yeah. and like you know, the, please style your hair like Yancey Cravat. Oh, he's got please. some great hair. Yeah, he's got um, some great hair. That his son one for one copies, which I think That's is true. very funny. Yeah. Well, because he's got that photo up on the wall that he's idolizing. That's um, true. The um the first half of this film had me. And then when he goes away for the first time and he goes off to go to the Cherokee lands now, after they've taken over the Osage people's lands. After he leaves that first time, it, oh man, it became much more boring for me. The beginning where it's like, I was like, oh, this is a Western. I'm watching a Western. We got shootouts. We've got bad guys. And like, he's wearing the white hat. There's all this like Western yep, imagery yep. and symbolism that's presented. I'm like, okay, I'm going to like, let's start getting ready to dive into it. Let's figure out what it's having to say. And then it like shifts away from that. And we're into this courtroom drama, which is like, um, underdeveloped plot underdeveloped like yeah, reasoning for yeah. the drama underdeveloped finish to the whole thing like so i just find that the second half of the film just drops off and if it were yeah. to continue on this western like high adventure pace from the beginning it would have been a lot better but i think yeah. we should get into some of those finer points because there is a lot to say about how this film executes its story and how it mm -hmm. gets it's it does have a message and how it gets it across let's talk about yancey because he I, I think we Wait, all we all point can we to first oh, this film, I want to, let's just say it out first. This film is like pretty racist and pretty stereotyped oh, throughout. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Like, there's some, there's some, there's insane... some pretty nasty like moments of just oof bigotry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. On the part but, of the filmmakers. Yes. Lots of uh, derogatory names given to Native American people. Lots of uh, racial stereotypes and things of all things of that nature. So, yes. Yeah. That, yeah. Just have that, just have that in the back of your mind uh, while you're listening to this discussion uh in, in everything that we're saying because you know if we're talking about where it orients itself politically it also very clearly uh has those notes in it mm -hmm. yeah which is so Especially confusing through the eyes of sabra who is the more sort of malicious of yeah. the characters that we're following in terms of the bigotry that she feels towards the woman who's like heavily implied to be a prostitute of some kind or run a brothel i guess mm -hmm. um and the way that she treats isaiah the the boy that's kind of their slave ostensibly but not really because not at that point in time it, it's very confusing and i think that puts a sour taste in my mouth when i'm wanting to learn about sabra as a character um because she's the one saddled with the most um bigoted lines and so when she becomes the focus of the film for that second half i'm like no i already don't really like you yeah and i don't really care for you to be successful because that implies that someone with your sensibilities and treatment of others can be the successful one um and so that balance i think I, i've kind of just it's kind of just popped in my mind like that i think is an element of why that second half of the film is so much less engaging to me because if this film properly established sabra as a character i was invested in and wanted to see her growth and or her growth to power in the second half of the movie, I think you could have a really interesting split down the middle story about the husband, story about the wife. But as it stands, as we've all said here, it does drop off a cliff significantly in that second half when we are quote unquote forced to um, watch Saber's life. But she's just the character that I care less about. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think Saber's actually a, an interesting place to start because after Yancey disappears, he goes he goes out further west. Um, she she is the one that we follow and it's interesting that they made that decision in her characterization because basically all of her bigotry uh towards native american people towards just the the people who are settling this area um towards uh the especially the the woman i don't know if we get a character name for her the, i think the actress's name is like dixie lee maybe that's the character's name again that's, that's the, the character's, character's name, name. 
Yeah. Uh, her bigotry towards Dixie Lee, especially. All these things are sort of planted. And then Yancey has to be the one we like, hey, don't be too quick to judge everybody. Da, 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 da. And then when he is gone, she still judges everybody. And then it's not until like it, it's the end of the movie in 1929. And she's like, uh, Yancey was right about everything after all. And here's a statue of him. I mean, so, there's there's yeah. the very strange sequence because we, we we see time pass so quickly in this film that it sort of becomes disconcerting, especially with respect to the children. Um, when we get to the moment wherein the the son named Cimarron mm -hmm, is yeah. um, explaining how he's going to marry a Native American woman, yes, and the the woman who has been there sort of servant for the last right. 10 years the or servant which... that replaced when what's his name isaiah was when killed, isaiah, yeah. was isaiah got shot I, yeah. yeah he did get shot didn't he he, he did yeah um but th that whole scene is basically about sabra being like upset that a native american is marrying into their family and then we learn that off screen yancey is totally cool with it right yep. Yeah, I think what's strange with the second half of the film is it's sort of like a tacit understanding that if we showed what Yancey was doing, we would probably feel kind of similarly to him as we do about Sabra, considering mm. where the the conquest he's he's embarked on, right? Yeah, and a, a th very active participant in. Right, I think that the film is not as politically progressive as it is, is trying to be or yeah. wants yes. to be in broad strokes. And obviously, bear in mind, we're watching the movie 100 years later, right? Yes. Yeah. It's, but I think it's also one that's based 40, initially 40 years before that. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but even in the context of its time, it's, it's trying so hard to like walk a line of ignoring what characters are doing when it's yes. convenient to like portray Yancey as a good man when mm -hmm. he kind of, he, he's not, right? But but the film nonetheless really 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 wants him to be because in a lot of ways he really is just like the archetypal American frontiersman, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. The the entire myth of the cowboy going west to stake his claim in the American frontier as per, you know, the frontier myth and all of this stuff in our history is Yancey. He leaves, he settles the land, he conquers it. He finds status. He, he kills some it. guys. Mm -hmm. He tames the land. He he becomes this symbol of virtue and progress. And then, sure, he leaves. What does he do when he leaves? Doesn't matter. Then he dies into martyrdom. He has a statue built out of it, and the film ends. Mm -hmm. So it's really unclear if it's even like a commentary on the dispossession of that value set when America's industrializing, because I don't really think that it is. I don't even, think so either. Yeah. Right, even though it tries to be, because I do think it kind of tries to be as the film's winding down. You it doesn't so? work. I think it, that it's. I think yeah. it's more glorifying that that idea though, because we're we're, we're meant to sort of um, not we're we're meant to miss Yancey when he's gone. We're meant to miss his you know sort of insatiable spirit about about the american west and he's off doing god knows what and we're back we're back home with the with the family um so i think the film is like largely obsessed with that idea as many westerns are of course this is uh the right. first western to win best picture being mm -hmm. the fourth best picture winner ever um one of only three by the way yeah. um unforgiven and the, the other two didn't come until unforgiven and dances with wolves in the 1990s which are like genre land in a way yeah what's that what is it, Could count Nomadland in a way. Those, oh, but all yeah. three of those examples are like genre deconstruction, yes. like postmodern looks at the Western. There is yeah. no real like John Ford type Western movies that are that one. Mm -hmm. No, and actually, I do want to say that I think is the reason why this movie interests me as much as it does. I think that having the backdrop of the American West and settling new land as a part of American history, I find to be much more compelling than the. Um, Native American and cowboy shootouts, tr train tracks, tumbleweeds, all the classic iconic imagery of Westerns is something that doesn't appeal to me on a very personal level. It's films that do subvert that, and I think in a way this does, focusing on the town being built up and the culture within the town that makes this film, to me, slightly more compelling of a Western mm -hmm. and not fall into Western tropes. I think covering yeah. a long period of time helps that. I think having the balance between the male and female characters, even though it's a little bit mismatched, helps with that and having Yancey be 
the myth of the American frontiersman, but he's also, as he's presented to us, much more of a businessman. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in yeah. that he's starting his his paper and he's going out and do, it's a journalism movie ostensibly and then Kinda he's is. also a lawyer and then he's also a pastor like yeah. these are elements it's you don't usually things. see in westerns and that does on a concept level put it a step above in terms of my interest but I also find myself longing for the cutaways to him riding across the the west on his horse like you know shooting his gun in the yeah, air and whatever, like Monument as Valley we're two or thirds, something exactly as we're two thirds of the way through because I'm like. I bet whatever Yanchi's doing right now is way the hell more interesting than what no, we're No, we watching. have to see yeah, all the and... old ladies complain about how the women from the brothel are in town and mm-hmm. helping children out of the mud. And they like, yeah. get no. your damn hands off of her. Get your dirty hands off that muddy little child. Yeah. I what agree with you, hate? Tucker. I think Yancey's position in the first half of the film is like super interesting because it is kind of different. He has, he has this white hat wearing you know, beacon of valor in this Western community, but he is the, like, civilizing, taming force there. He He's going after the bad guys, and he's going after them, the, the gangsters or whatever in the town, both. He's got the dual-pronged attack. He's going after them with the power of the revolver because he actually kills most of them, um, yeah. which is like, okay, like, I mean, but he says that he's going after them in the media and in the press. And I think his role as a newspaper he's man. trying to cancel them. He, he is, like, <laughs> is trying to cancel them. You're right. Well, because he is, Yancey is, and I, I can't believe I'm going to say this. Yancey is woke. He, he is, is woke. woke. For the time, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, like- what's, that's what I really want to talk about here. Because that's what I find so fascinating about this film yeah. in 1931. Because it we makes no about, damn sense. It, it compels me though. <laughs> it compels me though, because as we talked about, he is this. He is the mythical idea, I, ideal rather. <laughs> he's the idea, idea of the West. <laughs> he's, the, he's a god darn idea of the West. But at the same time, he is full of these platitudes about like, hey, really fucked up that we're taking the Native American people's land. Oh, there's an opportunity to go take more Native American land. Oh, I can land. go do it again? <laughs> I'm Yippee! right on it, baby. <laughs> but yeah. the, I, I wrote down some of these lines where he's like, in the church, the, there's some, some some Cherokee people in the church, like, during their mass service with all the denominations and everything. Which is a pretty and funny scene. A, I love the part where he he declares himself also a Hebrew pastor. Yeah, exactly. That's pretty funny. <laughs> um, but he says... The Cherokee is too smart to put money in the hat of the man who has robbed him of his birthright. Like, <laughs> holy <Yancey. laughs> ring ring base department. Like, come on. Like, this is like, that's a real ass line right there. And yet the it, film... it seems surprisingly forward thinking. Yeah. yeah and that, and but at the, the same just... time, he's like going off into Cherokee territory and, and murdering people and taking their land still. It's like. What what is the what did the writers of this film think they were doing or it, it, let, let going farther back the writer of the novel think they were doing with this like yeah. what is the what's the idea here? I mean, at a certain point, I just think that we people probably weren't radicalized exactly. enough to care that's, about the land that was already taken. Yeah, like at a certain point, it's just reflective of a value set that we don't hold anymore. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But but it is nonetheless sort of an interesting exercise in trying to determine what was sort of worth fighting for and what was already a foregone conclusion in the minds of these more, let's call them progressive characters like Yancey. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, you can look back and very easily point out the contradictions in them, and I think that's kind of one of the only interesting things to do with the film. But, like, yeah. you can't even really... You can't even really point to a moment in the movie where Yan- where what Yancey believes is, like, tested. Mm-mm. That's yeah. the really interesting thing about the film in that if there is conflict, it's resolved by the time we, like, fade to black. Because there's a lot of fading to black here and re- re- popping back up someplace else in time, right? But none of his interpersonal relationships, none of his land, his land taking, none, none, of, none of his business endeavors ever really need to be like reckoned with no i mean he shows he's always back up, in the right is the thing about yancey right he shows back up five years later after like abandoning there's something something really unintentionally humorous about him leaving on the land run and being like hey i'll be i'll talk to you soon and then it cutting to and he's been gone for five years yeah <laughs> yeah and then he immediately returns, and there's really no interrogation about his absence other than 
Sabra being up in arms, being like, you come back after five years and you're defending the whore. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. where it ends. Because they go straight into that. This man has been conquering and adventuring for five years. He's He runs back into town. He slinks in the house. He kisses his boy in the head. And he's like, oh, uh, court? Yes, please. There's and then lawyering he, he to do? He skips on over. Yeah. I think that the only conflict that is stretched out across the course of the film is the marriage dynamic between Sabra and Yancey and how that is played into in terms of Sabra's stress and Yancey's disregard for their relationship, ostensibly, as he leaves and comes back and leaves and comes back. But you're right in that the fade to black nature of that conflict is, for the, for that conflict, is the end of the film, is is he's about to die, and on his on his fucking deathbed, Saber he, like hears it's somehow that maybe it's his. Uh, <laughs> finds out somehow maybe it's him, then runs over to him, holds him in his her dying his dying arm, her dying arms. <laughs> he holds no, wait, him no, dying, dying in her arms. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and then is like, actually, I loved you. I love you, and it, this is you did such a good job. And and kiss, and then he dies, and that. Doesn't really make too much sense for for his character or the conflict they've set up. He's never he's never challenged with that because he never has to have a too deep conversation about the fact that he's been a absentee father figure and husband because he's just gone and then he's a long beard and he dies. And from that angle, the only possible continuing through line of conflict is washed away by the time the credits roll in. And I think in a very rushed and unsatisfying way. Yeah. But Sorry, uh, a question I was going to pose is, because we're talking about this, and do you think it would the film would have been made better if they just didn't have this, like, he's sympathetic towards the Native American cause? If it was just more of, like, a straight-up Western, and he were, like, the mythic frontiersman, and if he were, he like, were more well, yeah, we racist? Gotta settle- yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> essentially yeah tanner watch your words <laughs> but like because i think I, I it feel would like be less conflicted is with the, yeah it is with the cognitive dissonance that this film seems to have about it about its uh about its characters and, and therefore yeah. their conflict hmm. i mean it's just sort of an it's just sort of emblematic of the fact that the film doesn't actually care yeah like that's that's the bigger issue like it doesn't care the movie's not the movie's not about Native American people getting the vote. No, absolutely yeah. not. It, it's it's about Yancey getting the credit for them getting the vote. That's what the movie's about. <laughs> yeah. See, that's, that's explicitly in the narrative of the film. Like, the big moment around the vote is when, with reverence, Sabra is reprinting the thing he wrote in, like, 1907 wrote, or whatever. Yeah, decades about ago. About advocating for the vote. And I think... If if the pol- if the film's politics towards Native Americans are ambiguous at best, I'll let you know a little secret. The film is openly misogynist entirely. Yes, yes. It really does and, and not I, like women. No, and that informs a lot of it. And it's as I was joking about earlier. Like they don't they don't say whore. They say hussy, which is just like how you say whore if you're like 105 years old, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so so literally everybody is in this very traditionally masculine patriarchal system to the point where it's just like a foregone conclusion that not only would Sabra not take issue with Yancey leaving, yeah. she would also continue to run the paper under his name. When he long... hasn't been involved for 20 years or whatever. <laughs> right. And I think that's just emblematic of, how, of this film's political situation and that our values are clear, and then there's this money thing happening with like with like the Native Americans over here. But mm-hmm. the social structure and situation of Cimarron, I think, is very easy to parse. Yeah, yeah. Which is women are subservient always and continuously, and so I don't necessarily think it's that the film needed less ambiguity in the morals of Yancey as much as it is the film needed to either interrogate its political f- ideology or needed to like do something interesting with the plot yeah yeah abram we're gonna clip that part where you say women are meant to be uh <laughs> subservient always i i'm uh, just throwing just we'll do it for you too the moment the moment where i like where it was so clear like mm, ah this film this is what this has to say some part timed before 1919 he's like some care i don't know if it's yancey says to a woman they basically go like, right now, you don't have a say in how things are run, but you will soon. 
like yeah, it, 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 it really it really is toying with that that like hey we know this film is for a 1930s audience and uh don't you worry we're gonna hit all the we're gonna hit all the don't political you, highlights don't you remember 12 years ago when women yeah, exactly. were allowed to vote like um well, something I did want to bring up, this is, a, this is a weird thing, but it ties into an anachronism in the film, actually. It got it wrong, which is crazy, because as Timo just mentioned, it's only like 20 years removed from this thing actually happening. Um, is Okay, so for, you remember, when, first of all, when there's just that weird thing where Teddy Roosevelt's face just like kind of goes towards <laughs> the screen for a bit and then that, fades that away? That part was so weird, I loved it. I loved it. I yeah. was like, what the? Because I mentioned Teddy Roosevelt, and they're like, in case you forgot... Here's a picture of Teddy Roosevelt, and then yeah. you're like, "Oh, that guy." <laughs> Perhaps um, but anyway. they thought he wouldn't have been as famous as he ended up being back, you know, closer to his presidency. Any who's will be. It's really possible, actually. Um, during that during that period, set in 1907, uh, when he is running for the governor of Oklahoma, he is said to be running uh, under the Progressive Party. He is a pro- mm-hmm. he's the Progressive Party candidate. The Progressive Party didn't start until 1912 uh, under Theodore Roosevelt after he uh, unsuccessfully ran for a third term. So, yeah, they got they got that wrong. Well, it helps mm. in the script to make it really clear who he who Yancey is supposed to be. Yeah. Yes. It, it, it's, it's beneficial towards the already confused themes of this film. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> If we want to keep working backwards, talking about the the latter half of this film, I think we should talk about because we we sort of mentioned it, but the court scene I mm-hmm. think is pretty captivating. I I, I yeah. do I do like that scene. Um, when this movie decides to be like a court drama for about fifteen minutes, uh, yeah. because it's just trying to be a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think it's a it's a, an interesting scene because Yancey knows that he's just kind of like bloviating and he, he doesn't really have a case to run on. He's just trying to like out maneuver and out showmanship this other guy um and he does it it works and i think it's a testament to uh our yancey character's charisma in the yeah film. and, Don't I, and you, Tom, Dick combined with charisma yeah well, yeah richard dix's performance in that scene i think is great he is yeah. really chewing up the scenery and moving his arms around his hair is flopping up and down and he's as he's bounding around the courtroom and he does end up making a case ostensibly out of nothing in in an the idea of who are we to judge people who have their own pasts and we don't quite know e- uh, each other's histories and what caused us to make the decisions in our lives and so we, yeah. we should be understanding and respectful of the decisions that people have made. And, yeah. and I, I think that that ends up being like an interesting, somewhat interrogation of the cultural norms of this. Because you see people like scratching their chin and be like, mm, I didn't know that about her. Oh, that kind of <laughs> yeah. makes sense. And as the like charismatic main character that he is, you can see why he's able to sort of like quote unquote worm his way into the minds of everyone around him. Cause he just like, he like does big bravado things. But I think through what he says in each of these sequences, whether it's him being a pastor or a, a sense with a sheriff or a lawyer, he does have like a, a sense of right and wrong. That is pretty damn good for this period in time. Mm-hmm. I will say that the, the, his arguments that he puts forward are are is it the does is there a similar situation going on with Yancey's view of women as there is with Indians do you think does this scene the courtroom scene make the film does the film like push him towards being this progressive champion i guess, champion of women's rights champion of the individual liberty i guess Whereas he doesn't really act like that through the rest of the film. I find that his defense of Dixie Lee, it comes from the beginning of the film, right? We see him when he when he gets the land, you know, grabbed out from under him by mm-hmm. Dixie Lee. And then later he comes to her aid. Is it because he is like an upstanding? I take it as he loves to talk and he loves to be a lawyer. And that's why yeah. he does it. But like in another sense, is he doing it out of like the his like sense of right that this woman doesn't deserve to be pushed out of town. Yeah. It seems. I think it's. Yeah. Is it being clouded here or is the film contradicting itself in this moment again? I don't. I, well, first off, if there's one thing we know about Yancey Cravat, he has to intervene. He must. No matter what is going on, he has to intervene. Well, because he's the moral compass of, of everything in this film. Well, that's exactly it. What is the American frontiersman? He's he's like at the phalanx of justice and like American virtue, right? 
So what does he have to do? He has to stand up for the downtrodden, and it just so happens that the downtrodden happens to be Dixie Lee on the stand. Mm-hmm. And so he goes on this, like, like proto-Sorkin rant in the courtroom <laughs> for a couple minutes. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. It's, and it's fine. Like, I just... I just don't think that it, that it has anything to say, or it's really that interesting. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it's kind of humorous. Too. I yeah. think when the like when the film is well, like firing, the script can actually be kind of clever and kind of witty. But like witticism that's so hollow and so pointless doesn't really mean a whole hell of a lot to me. Like I do think there are some good lines throughout the film. I mean, even as he's dying, like "Hide me in your love" is not a bad line. It's kind mm-hmm. of an interesting turn of phrase, but. The 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 predicate for the court for the for the arrest of Dixie Lee is at best very vague. His reasons for going to defend her are at best very vague. Mm-hmm. The, they're also the, maybe somewhat. The he wants to go against trial, his wife. <laughs> right. The trial ends twenty minutes later, and it 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 appears that in the film, like it literally took twenty minutes for them to to to, to give all the evidence, have all the argu- arguments made, have the jury deliberate. And the verdict to be delivered. It seems like all of this happens in an extremely short amount of time, which makes mm. it seem funny and pointless to have a courtroom scene like this. But yes. I will say, you know, to the film's credit, uh, it does recognize, and Yancey even says afterwards, like, I didn't really have a case, but to be fair, they didn't either. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I yeah. do want to, I do want to pivot maybe into like the, the the action sequences of the film. Sure, yeah, because if we they're work actually, farther back. Yeah, yeah, more than I expected. Actually, we get a couple good shootouts here. Yeah. Um. Obviously, the main one is when the kid, another character who we're supposed to care about. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, not really. Well, yeah, because Yancey is very torn up over his murder, mm-hmm. and yeah, I guess the kid is true. introduced earlier in the narrative. Like, this is supposed to be a point. Of emotional stakes and to me it's kind of emblematic of where the film succeeds and where it fails in that just on the level of aesthetics i think especially for the time period it's quite a compelling action sequence mm-hmm. it's it's fun to watch but it's it's not tethered to any sort of genuine emotional feel or character moment because a lot happens in that scene isaiah is killed this person that yancey apparently has like a, a kinship with is killed his town is brought under siege he mm-hmm. has to like reconcile with his place on the frontier. His mortality, it, he gets shot too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's also like blase. It's just a sequence of information being delivered. Even like Isaiah's body is delivered in and like the scene fades yeah, we, and not we fade 30 seconds black. later. Yeah. I just it's it it's the it's the two elements of this film. It's a it's an aesthetic level compelling just like construction. But then beneath it, it's just nothing, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, I think there there is something there to uh, the inclusion of the kid and um, Yancey's sort of more frontiersman past, which is uh, really a kind of a, a, a secret, especially mm-hmm. at the beginning of this film. Um, Sabra's mother says something to the effect of, you know, we all know about his past. Or no, she sa- I think she says something to the effect of, you don't know anything about what he did before. Or something like that. And, and Saber's like, I don't care. And there's like a few other hints towards his past throughout the film. One that comes after that shootout with the kid and his gang. Where he like takes out his pistol and like files a little uh, little notch into the handle. And you see there's like seven or eight of notches. Yeah, six of them there. Um, and you're like, okay, so he's killed people in the past. He has this sort of like addiction towards going out into the into the wild west. And, you know, being a rootin' tootin' cowboy. This myth of the American frontiersman, um, but you know that's never really interrogated uh, throughout the rest of the film. There is no moment where he has to, where he comes clean or anything like that. And, you know, I could maybe give it credit for having some subtleism in that regard, but I think I kind of more leave it up to we have two hours here and forty years to cover. Yeah, mm-hmm. that is the weird thing about him dipping at the second part of the film because that is exactly the moment where you'd want him to be interrogating these things to learn a little more of his past to have that impact the relationships that he has and even if he is leaving at that point in time that's another good opportunity for us to follow him on one of these adventures to see what he's like when he's really in his element out in the west which we only see a, a, a couple like 90 seconds of at the very beginning um but the film does leave him and it basically doesn't return to him, though his presence is certainly felt. I think that it's like, I, I like the idea 
that this guy has a past that we're not quite keyed into. Mm -hmm. And that makes him more of a mythical figure of that he does have this past that we're like scratching at and we're like, oh, maybe he is kind of like this badass room tootin' guy, but we never got to see see that. And uh, and then having him a statue built to his uh, in his honor at the end, like there's these elements of him being like a larger than life figure that I think are portrayed through Richard Dix's performance and the bravado that he puts on. Yeah. But structurally, the film does feel like there's a hole in that in that second half because you and you can feel what's supposed to fill that hole. You're like, there's a Yancy cravat shaped hole there, and Yancy cravat would fit really nicely in that Yancy cravat shaped hole. Mm-hmm. There's there's another thing though that that is messing with his character in that. Let, let's talk. Let's just let's. What is the myth of the American West? Mm-hmm, well, okay. the myth of the American West is that this was unsettled land that allowed American, particularly American men, to go out and reinvent White themselves. Mm-hmm. White American men to go out and reinvent themselves, and through the American tradition of individualism build a new and better life for themselves wherein they are hardened by the land, they tame the land, they become upstanding, affluent members of American life. Part of the appeal of that is that it was people who had nothing in the East going West to mm-hmm. find something for themselves. Mm-hmm. The, one th- the one thing we do know about Yancey's past is that he's very well off, as is his wife. He's got they, they, stuff in Wichita. Yeah, he's a coming from Wichita where he already has a successful paper. He seems to have already practiced law. He has all these connections. So I think another part of the disconnect from the film is even if you wanted to just tell the archetypal westward narrative, we're already missing like the res like the quote unquote resonant foregrounding of a of an individual with nothing finding something. Mm-hmm. He already has it. So, like, I don't even think that watching Yancey go out and, like, shoot some guys in, in the prairie would have done a whole hell of a lot for me because we already know he's not, he's not, you know, he's not roasting his little can of cut, like, cut off beans over the fire. Mm-hmm. And, and weenies. <laughs> he's not doing that. Mm-hmm. He's staying in a big house in Wichita and he's making newspapers. Yeah. yeah. I think, so, I think and... what this film is trying to do is, is have it both ways, though. It exactly. is trying to, it, it is very surface level in that. Uh, it, it's wish fulfillment, and I think Yancey is less about that rags to riches story of the of the American Western myth, and more about the like the innate sense of justice that all Americans have, and we have to go and spread that across the uh, across this great nation, and you know settle it and settle it in the great American way, and you know uh, paste out paste out all, all the way to the horizon, coast to coast, and build the great American empire. That word empire. Uh, comes yeah. up a number of times in the yeah. film, and um, it, the beginning of a new empire. Uh, Yancey says over and over again. Mm-hmm. It almost makes Yancey a more nefarious character in that his motivation seems to be that there's just like an American disposition towards colonializing land. It's he, exactly what it is. No, it's like yeah, this, um, that, this idea that it's that is the American way to just go out and have that sense of an adventure and, and settle take what and, is and yours take. exactly. But right. yeah, uh, even though he. <laughs> Yeah, even though he seems to be friendly towards the Indians. I think that the the narrative that the film actually concerns itself with, with, which is the modernization and development of a town from its Western beginnings, from its boomtown start. Boomertown. Boomertown. I I say that. All the way to... And I pogged at each other. (laughs) To a big city and the ways that, in I guess... In this movie, the characters stay the same. I would argue in real life and in other movies, things change as a result. You know, Yancey, you were saying he starts out with a lot. He starts out with stuff and the t- typical Western story is gaining things. But I think it also can be losing something. And we don't True. see him lose that. I mean, he kind of loses. No, we don't his... see him, but he does. Yeah, well, he, do- he does lose it. And I think that's, you know, that, of course, as he is a, a metaphor, literally, for the American West. When we see him again, it's 1929. You know, the continental United States has been built up in this well, and uh, look early the, 20th century way. And the last place for all these old cowboys to be is on the oil fields, on the new exploitation yeah. of the land um, in mm. the newest and most profitable and most 
boom and that's town. where he goes and that's yeah. where he goes i and he's think like an old he, hermit because there's no there's no place else for him to to go to and yeah. that is why the film specifically chooses oklahoma and the um cherokee lands which they don't specify where that is but that's why those two places are picked because these are the last parts of the west that are closing off 1889 is very late in western history the civil war is like long over think about a lot of western stuff particularly the gold rush the mm -hmm. uh, the settlement of the far western lands, California, Arizona, Nevada, is all pre Civil War, and so now we're much after that. The amount of lands that can be claimed by white people in the country is just very less. They had already pretty much declared the frontier closed, if you remember back to high school history. And so the <laughs> the the this, I think that this story of the this like microcosm of the frontier being evaporated, and even though Yancey. In some ways, he is the one of the chief agents of the taming of the West in Osage. But it is also that taming, I feel like, that make causes him to feel like he has to leave. He I mean, kills the bad guys. He kills the bandits. The town mm -hmm. becomes a, a much more civilized town as a result. He promises a church will be built. And then, I guess, supposedly that happens off screen. And now he oh, can't okay. be in the town anymore because it's not like the West. I if you'll permit me, Timo, I want to talk about video games for a second. <laughs> All right, here we I go. Want to, I want to talk about Red Dead Redemption 2. Uh, Good okay. video game? I Hey, Abram makes a video game reference. I understand. A prequel right. to Red Dead Redemption, the, the original. Great point. Yes. What's this interesting... for Quest audience. <laughs> what's interesting about... Yeah, for people who don't know, because their audience is mostly 60+. plus. Mm hmm That's not yeah, true. Maybe There's younger number... than that. Let's not yeah. be rude. Let's not be 45 rude. 45 Not that it would be yeah. rude if they were old. No, no, absolutely not. But, you know, we, we, we've Older. taken a look at the demographics and we appreciate our audience. <laughs> you know, not... For people who aren't familiar, how, we'll frame it this way. For people who aren't familiar, could be children so young they, their mom won't even let them That's play true. Red Dead Redemption. That's true. We're <laughs> watching a Cimarron review. Yes. For all the seven-year-olds <laughs> watching the Cimarron review, yes. Red, Dead, Red Dead Redemption 2 is a game about cowboys who are trying to find a place for themselves at, in this similar time period where the West, where the frontier has closed... And their lifestyle is actively being stamped out. Which is, isn't that what the, I, I don't mean to get into video game talk here, but isn't that what the first game is about too? Because it's a, because that one's a prequel and the, the original game is set in like 1899. And the whole, the whole premise is like, the West is dying, you know? Right. Yeah. The, the, the point anyway. being, the point being though, what makes that narrative successful is that we are actively seeing these men and the ways in which their lifestyle is incompatible with the lifestyle that is developing in yes. the territory they're still in. So while I think that the film is about Yancey becoming a drifter, and while I think that it is also about the ways in which this town's culture grows and changes over the narrative, neither of those are really considered focal points of what happens. And that's yeah. what I find quite interesting, because we don't even we don't even get any time to learn what the cowboys in the coal in the in the oil fields look like really we arrive just for the point of action of Yancey's death we see that we see the town become this metropolis but it's it's as it's like between the time that the camera fades to black and comes back in mm -hmm, all of yeah. this stuff about cultural change is backgrounded we don't have to see the characters actually like wrestle with it ever and I think that's why these elements of change and continuity in the West don't really speak to me, because we don't get to see the characters actually have to wrestle with it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I yeah. think you're right. I think I was circling around an idea that ended up being a negative point towards the film. I think it is right. confused about what it's, what it has to say about the closing of the West. No. Yeah. I'm, well, we're talking about closing the West. I'm gonna reopen it and talk about like the the very opening of this film, the more yeah. pure no, Western don't part. Don't reopen of the it. West. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like Pandora's box. You don't want to open it. Um, but I, would, I want to talk about like the more purely Western part of it. We are well, we are in the the town. The streets are all mud. People are in covered wagons, and Yancey's got to come in and lay down the law. He's got his white hat on, and there's the bad guy over there. He's got his black hat on, and he's and he's you know, spitting his tobacco into a spittoon and being a bully to the to general people of this fine town. And we got to put the law down here. Um, and it, th that's it. It's good, you know. It does what I westerns like it. do, you know. It does the western thing. And yeah. as Tucker has said a number of times, I think Richard Dix is quite uh, uh, compelling and charismatic in this role of the western leading man. 
Um, there's a couple of times, like, I think that he even has, like, a couple of cool moments where, like, uh, it's after the bad guy, like, shoots the ha- shoots his hat, and, and he sort of, like, turns back towards him, and he, like, whips his sort of duster coat to the side, and you see his pistol hanging there, everyone, like, kind of, like, goes for the guns, but he pulls out, like, the handkerchief instead, and, sort- and like, sort of wipes off his hat, yeah. and that's a good moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, what about I, I what think, about at the end? This is a, just a moment of striking imagery that I want to note. The, the way he ends his sermon is with both guns on his hips, and he like he he stands around giving the sermon, pointing back and forth <laughs> with both guns. Sta- after he had like literally shot someone in front of five hundred people. Yeah, this film, as Abram said at the beginning, in through text message, which Tanner relayed to us here, mm-hmm. it has these moments of striking imagery and interesting action. In between the middle, these large moments of boredom. I think cinematogra- cinematographically, there are a number of cool shots. Well done, well composed, impressive frames that show up here and there. Like that bit at the end with the gun sticking out. Like the shot, the sequence with where he gets his hat blown off. I think that's a good effect. Where, it, mm-hmm. But it's very believable to me yeah. that he loses yeah. it and got shot through. I mean, go back even earlier. I find that the... the, the kinetic action of the land run at the beginning as everybody's yeah, yeah. on horses. Dances with, it's re- dances with wolves eat your heart out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> True. It, it's really quite beautifully shot and framed, and there's some interesting moments where the camera is down at the horse's feet and the, yeah. like running over it, and then we get these really nice... There's inf- the dude on the penny farthing, which is crazy. <laughs> That's so funny. I love the dude on the penny farthing. Yeah, there's, it's it's funny. It's inspired. It's well it's well executed. There are yeah. moments like that in this movie. Yeah, uh, trivia about that section. Since we brought it up, the land rush, the 1888 Oklahoma land rush, uh, took uh, five thousand extras, twenty eight cameramen, six still photographers, <laughs> and twenty seven camera assistants. What are they um, with they still apparently... photography? What? I don't what know, are they man. doing with still for like, just for fun? <laughs> just yeah, for like have, have, have photo photo evidence. It was six guys who who brought cameras. They're like, yeah, sure, you can take pictures. No, it, they they actually wanted six more f- um, motion picture cameras, but they just didn't get the right the little <laughs> no, miscommunication. Click right as fast as you can and take as many pictures as you can. <laughs> go 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 go! Like, oh, um, you brought but, the stills camera? Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but also, the, you know, they bought uh, art. This is an RKO picture or a radio picture, as the opening title states. Yep, yeah. Um, and they bought eighty nine acres of land in california to shoot this entire film and shoot that sequence and the uh the the set for the city itself um they bought 89 acres of land which became the rko movie ranch where many of their films were filmed Ah, Uh, yes because this is kind of at the beginning this is at the beginning of it all really in terms of hollywood history um and speaking of them you spending copious amounts of cash on this film uh, despite being in the depths of the Great Depression, RKO Radio Pictures was determined to raise its level of prestige in the industry with Cimarron. So, the studio invested more than one and a half million dollars, which is about $27 million in 2023 dollars, into the production of this film. Uh, while the gamble paid off in critical accolades, of course it won Best Picture, uh, and a record number of Academy Award nominations, I'm going to get to that in a second, the film lost $565,000, or about $10 million at the box office. Uh, so, it, even in adjusted money, 10, that's only half a 65's budget. That's not very impressive to me. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> that's a good Which, point. Which, I mean, hey, for the money that they spent, I mean, obviously, even even adjusted for inflation, the $27 million is is low for yeah. what you this movie's production budget looks pretty damn good and i think that that we're talking about all these interesting things with um with the cinematography and the camera placement and the set design that i think is why i find it tough to critique this movie too thoroughly yeah. because as one of the first sound westerns one of the mm-hmm. very early on in the history of sound that I think can't be understated how yeah, yeah. technically impressive this film very, is. Very is much. You're so used to those, well, you're, but if you watch films from the earliest era of sound film, you can be very used to it being incredibly static. They're in enclosed spaces, not, not too much echo, not too much background noise. Yeah. But Although, none of that is true th- with do... this movie. They really do, they just explode what's possible, which I think was really impressive. This is this movie came out the same year that Fritz Long night for Fritz Long's film M did so, oh, the, yes. and we talk about the the previous Best Picture winner, All Quiet on the Western Front, working really well. 
So I agree with you, Tucker. By and large, they get real static around this time in history, but we do have a number of shining and sure, of course, shimmering. I guess I don't know how do you how do you make shining Shimmer into on. a sound? Shimmer analogy? on examples, yes. Yeah. Um, Tanner, what, what, what you else got do your, I have here? You got the nominations. I feel like we should just hit the nominations, give this thing a score, and then uh, I feel similarly. Be in our Close the episode. Way. Close high the rickety, the I do. High rickety, do I have the wins oh, and noms? Didn't here. say that enough here. High <laughs> rickety, <laughs> high <laughs> rickety. Uh, Anyway, this film won Best Picture, Best Adapted Screenplay, and Best Art Direction, which is Best Production Design. It was nominated for Best Lead Actor for Richard Dix, Best Lead Actress for Irene Dunn, and Best Director, Wesley Ruggles, as well as Best Cinematography. And, because this is the fourth uh, Academy Awards... Cinematography. Yes, very good, Timo. Um, as we, as this was the fourth Academy Awards, it got a number of uh, superlatives from for these nominations and wins. Bring those it, back. Yeah, exactly. Well, yes. There were only eight categories in 1930 and 1931, and with seven nominations, uh, it was Cimarron got the most that any film had gotten up at t- up until that time. Uh, it so uh, it's aside from um original screenplay which is it wasn't nominated for or like it couldn't be nominated for it got every nomination it could um it also was the first movie that stood a chance of sweeping all five major categories uh, a film that would be a, a feat that would be repeated only a couple years later with anyone anyone it a couple years later night. it happened one night very good mm. Tucker. yes so yeah, first first film nommed in the best or the big five uh, first film to be, you know, or the only film really to be able to be winning all of the categories. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Wow. I don't know. Wow. I, in some ways, thank God the Academy has improved and modernized. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. I don't know if I have anything else here. Um, da, 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 da. I like the screen. Didn't, didn't you have some lines that you read, that wrote down or did you read them all already? Um, let's see. I, I, I like the yell that he does when he's talking to that guy. You guys remember the yell? Yeah, I remember <laughs> he goes, that part. He's like, oh, how does that scene go? That scene was so funny. Oh, my God. Because the guy, the bad guy says something to him, and he's like, thanks for the sentiment. Now here's mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just screams into the air. That's it's like, good. it's like lol random humor from, yeah. Fully a hundred years before that was actually <laughs> funny. It's mm-hmm, to which mm-hmm. that a tertiary character explains that it's like some Native American like w- chant, meaning it's gonna be you or me, and it's just a I very just, there's a lot of unintentional comedy in this film. Yeah, I would I much rather that was not explained and just left to him right. being like, "This is my <laughs> sentiment." <Yeah>. Ow, ow, <laughs> um, there's also, I, another line I wrote down, which is another Yancey being like, oh, these stupid, bigoted yokels from, from Oklahoma. He says they have one chamber one chamber minds and mighty small caliber. That's yeah. a really good line. Best, best adapted screenplay and not for no reason here, folks. Some killer <laughs> lines here. Well, shall we give this one a score? Yeah. Hi, Rickety. I say we do it. Hi, Rickety. Hi, Rickety. <laughs> Hi, Ricky. Okay, All I got right. mine ready. When he says too? hi, Rickety, you know you ain't gonna see him again. <laughs> <laughs> boop, boop, boop. Okay, I got mine in. Let's do it. All right, three, two, one. Reveal. <laughs> okay, we have no tie tonight. Uh, no deliberation needed. The film got a 4.7, so that's going to put it at the 79th, no, the 80th spot. On the list, 4.7, pretty low, so there's only about uh, 10 films below it. The point breakdown, starting from the bottom, I gave it a 3.6, followed by Tanner's 4.7. Abram gave it a 4.8, and then Tucker gave it a 5.7. So oh, one of us got over half. There you yep. go. There yeah. you go, folks. This I film, wish I'd given it a lower score, because it unfortunately unseats from here to eternity at the 80th spot. <laughs> mm-hmm. No! This film is like too is it's too racist for to give a good score in my mind. Like I just can't get it's like too racist, guys. It yeah, come on. Yeah. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. Well Isaiah, start uh, come on. He he have you ever seen anything like where he had they have the little platform that is hanging above the dining room table for which so he just weird. sits the there? Is that he just waves a fan for the white people? And come this on, is how here. he is introduced. Yeah. 
That's true. It's true. And then he falls into like a plate of flour or something like that. Mayo. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's mayo. I don't know if they had that back then. Mm-mm. So, any closing thoughts on Cimarron? They're just eating spoonfuls of flour and going. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good closing thought, Abram. Thank you. I didn't, you know what? I thought I was going to genuinely just hate this movie, but I found there to be interesting stuff to think about no, yeah. while I viewed like, it. And the the racism, it, it can dissolve away if you choose to let yourself not pay attention to it. Horrible bigotry aside, and that's a big thing to wave aside, <laughs> it's not like the worst thing I've ever seen. Thank God it's only two hours. That's yeah. true. They, it, this very easily could have been like two and a half, three hours. I mean, yeah, I mean, we got to contextualize, unfortunately, a lot of it's sort of political messaging around the fact that it is a film from 1931. Yeah, And I think a lot of my praises come from the sim- uh, the, the similar context- contextualization, as Tucker is saying, of the, of the scale and, and of these sort of aesthetically exciting sequences. And the way that we do still manage to, you know, keep up some kind of momentum. Even if yeah. the film ends up feeling boring, we're not lingering too long. We we keep moving and these things happening. I think that it is, I think it is a watchable movie. Yeah, but it's a movie that is deeply troublesome in terms of its political and thematic messaging, and I think that its characters go nowhere. And you know, uh, as just with just the he's always uh, moving. year, he is after, always going somewhere. The yes. year after this was All Quiet on the Western Front. Or you before? Before. Either way. Year, the year oh. before this was All Quiet in the Western Front, and so it is possible to have a film come out in this era that has a sort of evergreen political message. Cimarron is not one of them. No. No, but you it also is don't... more of an evergreen, interesting uh, film thematically, which is why yeah. I gave it a above-average score. I think this movie commands my attention and my mental interests more than your average film. The sure. ways that we talk about its situation in its time, whether that is through the bigotry that it does portray or the fact that it is surprisingly progressive in many ways for the time. I found myself consistently surprised by this film uh, throughout because seeing so many one-star, half-star ratings from my friends on Letterboxd, of course, that's Letterboxd, you have to connect with us and that, but even, mm-hmm. even uh, externally, this film has low scores across the board. I'm not saying I completely disagree with that, but I think that I was expecting this to be super run of the mill. And from that regard, I would say it's not. I was surprised by the positions this film took, the um, way that it subverted the Western genre by focusing it on the growth and the uh, um, the time scale of a city growing from nothing. And Yancey, I found to be a surprisingly compelling main character with a, a really compelling lead uh, leading the whole film. And there's just so many ideas going through this film that I, res- I respect it for trying. So many yeah. things. Cause it's so it easy swings. to make a Western that does nothing. And I think yeah. this film does a lot of things. It doesn't work in those things, but I like that it's consistently swinging. I, yeah. It's it's like if you saw a baseball player and he was just swinging his bat over and over and over again, you'd be like, that's that's weird, but I can't take my eyes off of him, you know? <laughs> he's got yeah. He's gotten six strikes and he hasn't gone back to the dugout yet. <laughs> <laughs> no one can grab him because he just keeps swinging. <laughs> Oh, Cimarron. Shall we go to a more evergreen topic, which is the spin wheel? Yes. That was an okay transition. (laughs) It's not even evergreen because it's almost dead. I know. It's it's almost depleted of its life. Slowly depleting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It'll eventually be never green. Never green. Very good. Very, very good. Well, uh, you want to give us a little singing, Tanner? I suppose I will. Wheel, wheel, what's your deal? Give us a movie that makes us squeal. Is it on digital? Is it on real? Wheel, wheel, what's your deal? Ha, rickety. <laughs> and the wheels deal is a number three. Number three. Number three will give us the 1994 Best oh. Picture winner. This is a film oh. that you guys might recognize. A I film think I do. starring mm. such faces as uh, Haley Joel Osment. Uh, Sally Field, Gary Sinise, Robin Wright, Tom Hanks. We'll be watching Robert Zemeckis' 1994 somewhat classic, n- definitely classic, Forrest oh, 100%. Gump. Yeah. Somewhat classic. Forrest Gump. No, I was going to say somewhat classic. I was going to say somewhat masterpiece, but I don't know. I haven't seen this movie in forever. But then I, I also haven't seen this movie in forever. Um, yeah. We've all seen this one. It's Forrest Gump. I haven't Gump. seen we've this movie seen in ever. 
I haven't oh, seen this movie all Abram, the way through. Have you not seen Forrest Gump? I've never seen it. I have not wow. sat my, my my rear down to watch the whole thing front to back. No, I've been excited to watch this one because, as Tucker mentioned, this is a classic film. This is one of the all-timers here. Mm -hmm. um, Oft-parodied, oft-cited, oft-acknowledged, uh, oft-seen by lots and lots of people, oft-showed in uh, uh, high school history courses because it's, again, one that spans decades and decades. Uh, specifically the tumultuous 1960s. Um, but it's also been sort of turned on in the modern era, I would say. people. Lots of, I've been noticing lots of Forrest Gump slander in the recent years. So I'm interested mm. to return to it, to give it, to give it a more critical eye. Yeah. I, I feel like if I had to make a list of the 10 films I am most... Like, it's it's most ridiculous that I haven't seen this will be on it. Me too. So I'm, quite I'm, gonna... a, I'm very excited to watch it. Thank you, yeah. Quest. Yes. Well, life may be like a box of chocolates, but um, Quest, you, you usually know what you're getting each time you open up that link, that video. That's not very, <laughs> that's not a good sign. Lieutenant Dan, something ranked me. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, We're gonna get all the quotes. We're gonna hopefully all I can make better puns about mm -hmm. Forrest Gump than Cimarron. Um, oh. I am looking forward to this. We'll keep on running. We've got a, only a little bit ways to go in the quest for the bestest. And oh, so glad to be talking about a movie that hopefully we all like and um, and get to have a fun time with on the next time. So I got another one. I got another one. <gasps> question is as question does. There you go. Remember quest that. Quest is white. <laughs> Wrong movie. <laughs> That's Elvis. <laughs> right guy, though. Right guy. Right guy. He's also Elvis in this movie. Elvis in here. Wow. Well, we're gonna we're gonna watch this film and talk all about it next time on the quest for the bestest. Until then, peace. <laughs>